Okay, so we are now live. Let's see. So this is part of the Galaxy Resources for Different Communities series, and this is the third of four. This one is for tool developers. The next one is two weeks from today for admin and infrastructure providers. Um, today we have three presenters, and here's our agenda. Um, Dan Blankenberg, uh, Galaxy PI, and from the Learner Research Institute is going to introduce us to resources for um, tools in the Galaxy ecosystem. Uh, Anthony Bertaudu, and I apologize, Anthony, for that pronunciation. Um, we'll talk about Dockerizing Galaxy for tool publishing. And then finally, Peter Novak of um, Repeat Explorer is going to talk about publishing your tools in your very own public Galaxy server. So let's see. Okay, let's get out of there. Escape, and I'm going to stop my share. Okay, um, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, so today I'm going to be showing you about uh, where you can find resources for making tools available within the Galaxy ecosystem. Um, so a brief outline of what we'll be talking about uh, on this portion of um, this webinar is first I'll sort of talk a bit about standard Galaxy tools. These are basically command line tools that people generally think of when they think about Galaxy tools. Um, I'll touch upon uh, Galaxy interactive tools, um, also on to uh, data source tools, and then as well as um, external display applications. Uh, these are all different ways that you can use to connect your software uh, with Galaxy. So first we're gonna start with Galaxy tools. So where can you find all this information later? Um, everything's available from the Galaxy Community Hub, which is available at galaxyproject.org. Um, in the top here, if you click on learn, uh, you'll then click, be able to click on teach uh, with Galaxy and that will take you to the Galaxy training materials. Um, or you can go directly to training.galaxyproject.org in order to get to the Galaxy training materials. Um, and so we're going to be going through a few of these options uh, right now. We'll be going to um, the tool development and integration into Galaxy uh, set of training materials. Uh, and so I'm just gonna switch over here to um, the, the Galaxy Community Hub, like I said, and we can click on Teach with Galaxy which will take us to the Galaxy training materials. Um, and then we're gonna come over here where it says Galaxy for developers and admins under development in Galaxy. We're gonna click on that link and that will take us to a list of topics that we can use for uh, developing with Galaxy. Let me see if I can make this bigger. And so then we can go ahead and we can see all these various topics that are available. Um, and the one we're going to be concentrating on right now is this Galaxy tool development and integration into Galaxy. Um, and there's two links here. Uh, one, one link that we'll look at first will take us to um, the, the tool integration slide deck. And then there's also a, a bunch of hands-on tutorials that you can follow along as part of the uh, Planemo documentation uh, available here. So we're just going to start by taking a look at these slides. I also want to point out that if you want to, you can view the slides in uh, various languages just by clicking on this drop down. Um, and that will generally use um, uh, Google Translate unless if uh, um, manually translated options are available. And so here we can see that we now have our tool uh, development integration slides. Um, and so let's go ahead and we'll take a look. So first we're going to talk about what is a tool for Galaxy, then sort of how to write a best practice tool how to deal with the tool environment. So for example, dependency handling and so forth. Um, and so here we go. And so inside of Galaxy, hopefully everyone's familiar uh, with the Galaxy interface. If you're not, there's uh, tutorials available for getting familiar with the Galaxy interface from that same uh, training.galaxyproject.org link. Um, but here's your general UI, your user interface inside of Galaxy. On the left-hand side, you have your list of your available tools. They're arranged in sections. You click on a section, it will expand the tool. Then you can click on uh, the link when you for that tool. When you click on that link, it will put the interface for the tool inside of your middle pane. Here you can select your input data sets, configure your input options. And then when you click execute, the job will then be executed on some compute resource, a cluster somewhere, um, or on your laptop, for example, if you're using a, a, a development instance. 
Um, and when the job is executed, a new box will appear in this right hand side, um, which is known as your history over here and your data sets. Um, and they'll, they'll start down at zero and they'll work their way up uh, in, in a sequential fashion, recording all the steps that you've done as you perform your analysis. Um, and so one of the big things that we'll concentrate on here is this uh, general idea of the Galaxy Tool Wrapper, which is what we can use to, to sort of control the, the generation and the viewing of the Galaxy uh, interface. And so here we have our, for example, a Galaxy uh, Tool Wrapper um, where we have our input file. Um, and this is really just going to be uh, working around to a um, command line executable. In this case, this is a, a Python file um, for Graphland, but this could be uh, compiled C code. It could be uh, Java code. Uh, it could be a Perl script. Um, it can be a shell script, just any sort of command line executable um, that accepts uh, input options. And, and so basically we can generate this inside of Galaxy and this would be your typical command line. Um, and, and so, when we think about these inside of Galaxy, we can see here that we have some, some tool on uh, some compute resource. We have our Galaxy instance that generates a command. Inputs are put, passed in, the, the inputs and that command are pushed out to that compute cluster um, and outputs are defined within that tool. And that's actually what ends up being pushed back to your Galaxy instance. So when this, this actually happens, we, we have a very simple XML description here. This is a very simple hello world tool that's just calling echo um, and it's going to, output the, the string hello world. It's gonna, imp, it's gonna re, use a, a placeholder here to replace this my string here with this input text box. Um, and you can see here that then we see this my string gets passed over to, to this my string. This output one data set that's defined is put over here on, on um, command line redirection for the, the output to store it. Uh, and this, when you click on execute, for example, it'll just execute echo, hello world. If you put in, um, you are amazing within that box, would then store that within your, your Galaxy data set and it would then put out, hello, you are, hello world, you are amazing. And that would be the, the item that, that appears in you know, your history. Um, and so when, when we sort of talk about how to invoke the tool, um, it's important to think about your underlying dependencies. And so there's a requirements tag, we can define a package and then a version for this package. And in this case, we have Graphland. Um, and then we have a command line uh, that's generated here. It's uh, generated using the, the cheetah syntax. Um, uh, and so basically we can use a nice templating format in order to replace all of these items um, for, for, for your Galaxy uh, tool that you're trying to develop here. Um, and so you can see here, we have uh, uh, more of a, uh, another example. Um, and then if this is a uh, requirement from an actual package, you can just call that generally speaking um, directly as an executable. In this case, we actually can execute this also if we had a, a Python script we wrote ourselves just called uh, graphland.py that we held next to the XML file. We can then just use Python as the underlying requirement and just call a uh, Python on that file. Um, and, and so here we can see that this is a cheetah uh, templating language. And so we can have control statements like if, um, else, fors, loops, you can have all sorts of different uh, standard constructs within that, that, that syntax. Um, and so here we have various different types of input uh, data types. And so in this case, we have a parameter that's actually type data. So it'd be an input data set uh, of a format text. And so we can restrict the format uh, that's accepted by that tool by changing uh, this, this, this entry here. For example, if we only wanted to include FASTQ files, we could put FASTQ here um, and, and so forth. Uh, we give it a name that we then use uh, for that internal um, uh, placeholding purposes, a label, which actually is what gets displayed to the user in the user interface. And then we have help here that can show up here under that, that parameter input. There's lots of different types of parameters. So for example, this, we have an example of an integer parameter we also have an example of a floating point parameter. Um, and optionally with these numerical types, you can specify a minimum and a maximum uh, along with the starting initial value. And so if you do a minimum and maximum, uh, you then out also get a slider along with that, that input box. Um, and so you, can, you, you have a lot of control over how you can design your input forms for everyone. Um, text is very, you know, it's one of these very basic types. Uh, and then we also can 
generate select lists, and these select lists can be generated dynamically um, or, or statically. In this case, we have a statically defined select list. Um, and with the options, uh, the internal value that will end up getting passed to your underlying tool, along with the, the option that's actually displayed uh, to the user uh, within their interface. Um, and, and so you, you can do multiple different types of select. And in this case, we have another type of uh, select here um, where we have a multiple select. And so you can have multiple options that you're selecting, for example. You can have uh, Boolean parameters, and you can also have these really nice things called conditional parameters. Uh, where you have uh, one of these select lists and based upon which item you're going to change select here, paired or single end, it can display different um, sets of options under that conditional parameter. We can also have repeat parameters and so that you can just define one set of, uh, for example, series here, we have your, your input data set and then the, the, the column that you're going to be defining for that input. And so this is actually using the metadata value from your input data set um, to decide which columns are actually going to be available for that um, selection here based upon this data set that's being selected. Um, and then what's, how do you actually define what sort of outputs you want to produce? So here we, we have an example where you actually have two different outputs that are being created, a tree file, and then also an annotation file. Um, you can have any number of outputs that you would like, and you can have data set collections, and you can filter out the options that you want to have as well. Um, there's a whole lot of different ways to configure these tools. Um, one of the, a very important part I just want to point out is that you also want to be able to include citations with your tools. Uh, and so this is a great way that if you wrap a tool for Galaxy, um, when someone uses that tool inside of Galaxy, they'll be able to automatically see the citations and be able to actually extract the citations from, from a history where they use the tool later on. Um, there's a lot of information in here, and I'm just going to quickly uh, move through most of this just so we can get to Planemo. So Planemo is this really great command line utility to help you build Galaxy tools. There's a whole lot of documentation available, uh, along with building tool tutorials. And if you're actually really interested in following these, I definitely recommend following uh, these tutorials, for example, uh, and, and, the, and the documentation. Um, but basically, just to briefly outline what Planemo can give you as far as a, a, a Galaxy Tool SDK, um, it has a nice Planemo init command where, where, where it will automatically initialize um, a Galaxy Tool wrapper for you. Um, and then it also has additional um, availability for um, linting your tools, making sure they adhere to best practices and also for uploading them to uh, the, the Galaxy tool shed so that other people can then automatically install your wrap tool into their Galaxy instance. And so here's an example of the uh, Planemo uh, init command. Um, you can use Planemo lint in order to lint your tools. Uh, and when you're building up a tool, you can use this nice Planemo serve command in order to pull up an, uh, a, a Galaxy instance that you can then just use to, to work on your tool that's under development. And, and this is a very sort of iterative process. And of course you should write tests. Um, and I recommend if you're really interested in adding a, a standard Galaxy tool to, to your Galaxy instance that you go ahead and you go through these tutorials and through these slides fully. But I just wanna uh, quickly uh, pop back to um, here and just give a little bit more information about the Galaxy tool shed. Um, and so if you wanna have your tools available within Galaxy, you really want to make them available to everyone. And so you want to add them to the Galaxy tool shed. Um, and so what the Galaxy tool shed, think of it as the app store for Galaxy. Uh, this will allow you to install tools, data types, data managers, and so forth. Um, and so it allows the Galaxy administrator to actually install and update tools. So you have different versions of a Galaxy tool. You have multiple versions all installed at once. And so if you have an old workflow that's using an older version of a tool, it can continue to use that old version or you can upgrade it to use a new version of that tool, for example. Um, but if you're really interested in getting access to the Galaxy Toolshed, I recommend you follow uh, along with these Galaxy Toolshed slides as well. Um, now we're gonna just move on to what a Galaxy Interactive tool is. So those tools we have all seen before, these are all command line tools that are executed um, perhaps on a cluster somewhere, you know, basically just sent off into batch modes. For example, if you're using Slurm, you would just be you know, submitting it to your Slurm queue. It would run somewhere, come back with the, the results. But what happens if you actually have um, a tool that has its own graphical user interface already? Um, you can create a Galaxy Interactive tool for that. 
Um, and so the, the big difference here with the Galaxy Interactive Tool versus a standard Galaxy Tool is that it's required for the dependency to be inside of a container so that the networking can be handled. Um, and then you specify one or more entry points that's composed of a port and optionally a URL. And if you wanna see several examples of those, those are available within the, the Galaxy um, uh, main source repository. Um, but so here's an example. We have our familiar Galaxy XML file. We have a requirement on a container somewhere. We specify an entry point. Now a user selects that interactive tool that appears in their middle pane. They can configure that tool, uh, interactive tool, just like they normally would. They click execute. But in this case, instead, they actually end up with uh, an interactive web server that's been launched inside of a gal inside of a Docker container in this case um, that they can then interact with, play around with, uh, look at their data and so forth. Um, but basically you, you're relying on an external tool, um, you know, a, a executable that creates an, uh, an interface that's not inside of Galaxy in this case. And so we can integrate those tools inside of Galaxy as well. Uh, and just a quick, quick view of how this works. And thanks to Helena for providing the slide. Um, and if you're really interested in Galaxy interactive tools, there's actually a, a webinar just a few weeks back and that's, that's available on, on the, the YouTube channel, I believe. Um, and now let's just talk quickly about data source tools. So let's say you wanna get data into Galaxy, but you're running like a data warehouse. Um, and so you don't want to require a user to download all that data and re-upload it to uh, the Galaxy server. And so we do support some protocols for, for, for providing this sort of uh, idea where a user can actually click inside of their Galaxy instance, get forwarded to this external resource, in this case, UCSC um, table browser, configure the table browser, then actually click on a, a send query back to Galaxy. And this all happens inside of the browser, then Galaxy will then later on go and fetch that data down. Um, and if you're interested in, in sort of seeing more about this, um, go ahead and check these links as well. Um, now quickly, just talk a little bit about um, Galaxy external display applications. Um, and so let's say you have a web server somewhere out there on the web somewhere that accepts input data from users and can display stuff on that, that, that interface, um, or it could be another analysis platform, even if you wanted it to be. Um, but you want to connect basically a Galaxy's user data sets um, to this external uh, resource. Uh, you can do that using uh, Galaxy external display applications. Um, and so here we actually we have an example of a Galaxy history and a data set within that history. In this case, this is a BAM file um, about 30 gigabytes. And we can see here we have multiple different um, display applications available. Um, in this case, we have a view at BAM.io bio. Um, and so if a user goes ahead, they can click on this link, they'll actually get forwarded in their browser to bam.io bio, uh, along with a URL that refers back to their data set, um, along with, um, in this case, we have a BAM file. So we have the BAM file and we have the index file both available. Uh, and we can see here for an example of a, a simple uh, display application um, that, that we have defined here, bam.io bio, it basically points to their server provides a BAM file um, and we have to find our BAM file here from our Galaxy uh, history item. And then also the, the BAI file, the, the index file that's been defined um, as part of the metadata for that BAM file as well. And so this is all then available. And the way you make these available is you assign these Galaxy external display applications um, to that, that um, data type here. And so here we have inside of our data types conf.xml file, we have our BAM format, which is a, a, of a type of uh, display binary BAM. Um, uh, and so here we then have our BAM.xml file that points to here. And that's how we tell Galaxy then to load that. Um, this is an example of a, a static application, but you can have more complex dynamically defined applications. Um, and, and, and so if you wanna see more examples of those, you can look at the, the supplemental material from this paper that came out recently. And if you wanna see a tutorial about uh, how to uh, build um, the, these uh, external display applications inside of Galaxy, there's also additional information um, available here. Um, and of course, I wanna uh, convince everyone to join the Galaxy community um, and I, you know, build tools, get your tools into the Galaxy, get them used by people. Um, it would be, you know, really great to see what everyone else can build inside of Galaxy. It's really exciting. It's a great community. Um, I invite everyone to, to, to come along. One other thing I did want to point out uh, quickly 
um, is that when you are at the um, training materials in particular, if you, you notice that here we're at our Galaxy uh, the development topics and there's a chat available here that uses Gitter. And so you can actually click on open chat and that will actually connect you um, to, to this, um, to this uh, uh, Gitter, Gitter application so that you can actually join and chat and so forth. Um, and you can see, you can connect here, you can sign in uh, using various different things. There's also a whole bunch of different uh, channels available. And so this connects us to our, our dev channel. Uh, if you're interested in other channels, if you click on this, this globe up in the upper right hand corner, um, it'll show you a whole bunch of other channels that are available um, for various other topics um, for uh, the Galaxy project. And with that, I want to hand it off to our uh, next speaker, please. Thank you, Dan. Anthony, you're up. I'm ready. Okay. I'm just sharing my screen. And that's it. So you all see it. Yes. Perfect. So let's talk about Docker and Galaxy now. Um, so the first thing you need to know is that there is a, a Docker image available for to launch um, very easily a Galaxy instance um, within seconds or maybe minutes maximum. Uh, its name is key.io slash big running slash galaxy. And uh, just by running this command, you can launch on your PC or Mac or whatever uh, a Galaxy instance that you can access at this address. So it's a Docker image which is based on uh, Ubuntu 1804. Um, and it includes everything you need to run a, a Galaxy uh, server, which means uh, the Galaxy web apps. Uh, the PostgreSQL uh, database, uh, an FTP server, and every uh, other components that may be needed. So as any other Docker containers, it is, uh, you can throw it away when, when you have finished uh, using it, but you can uh, also persist all the data uh, you generate while using Galaxy by uh, just mounting a single directory, which is a slash export. So you can uh, launch your Docker in, uh, container, do whatever you want, and uh, back up this single repo, uh, directory, and you can uh, come back later and, and, uh, and uh, relaunch the same container with all the data you have generated um, earlier. So the, the, um, the image of uh, Galaxy is developed at this address on a GitHub repository. And so you are free to go and, and look at the Docker file and contribute if you want to improve it. Um, you have access to every um, setting that you would find in a galaxy.yml file for configuring Galaxy uh, uh, behavior. So everything is done by using environment variables. And when you run jobs from the Galaxy interface, um, by default, the jobs are run inside the Galaxy container, but you can also configure it to run them uh, on external uh, compute uh, resources like a Slum cluster, for example. Um, by default, uh, the container is launched with uh, all the tools uh, that are the default Galaxy tools uh, from the Galaxy source code. But <clears throat> as we will see now, you, you have the possibility to create some Galaxy flavors, which are just a kind of specialized Docker image for specific uh, scientific fields. So for example, you can build your own image um, and there's a, a, a catalog of existing images, for example, to, to, to perform genome annotation, RNA analysis, or metagenomics. Each one of us has a specific Docker image with pre-installed tools, workflows, and uh, data. So there is a list available on, on this page. Um, and now we'll see how you can uh, easily create your own flavor with your tools and your data. So when you're inside the container, you have access to um, a specific command, which is install tools. Um, and all you need to do to install tools is to write a YAML file listing all the tools you want to install from the tool shed. So you have a, uh, an extract at, on the right side here. So in this case, we wanted to install the, the tool named Compaline P from RNA team owner from the tool shed. And we wanted to install into a RNA alignment section in the tool list. And you have another, a few other tools that need to be installed. You can even specify a, a specific uh, version of the tool. 
once you have written uh, this YAML file, you just need to, re to, to run the install tool commands, which will uh, perform the install step into, into Galaxy automatically for you. You can do uh, almost the same for, for workflows. So if you have a collection of workflows that you have exported from a, a Galaxy instance in a GA format, which is the default one, um, you just need to run the workflow install um, command and give it a directory with all these uh, GA files and uh, the workflows will be uh, installed into the, your Galaxy instance and made uh, available for users to use it. Um, you can also add uh, data libraries to, or, or, well, um, to, to populate data libraries. You just need to write a YAML file uh, once again, with a standard format like this, where you specific the, the different sections and um, the, the URL to fetch the files from internet and uh, the data types for each file. Once you have written this, uh, this uh, YAML file, you just need to, to use a specific command once again, which is set up data libraries, which is quite uh, simple. And finally, you may want to, um, to add some reference uh, data like uh, reference genomes on, on your Galaxy instance. So to do this, usually you use data managers into uh, Galaxy. And there's a possibility, uh, a special command, which is run data managers, which, which takes as input a list of data managers, uh, which need to be run with specific options to uh, populate all this re reference data into your instance. So when you put all these together, it's very easy to create your own uh, Galaxy flavor using this uh, YAML uh, syntax and specific commands to execute uh, uh, the tasks you, you need. So all you need to do is to create a, a structure like this, a directory with a Docker file where you say that you want to create an image based on the official one. You can customize it with a brand name uh, here. And then you say, okay, I want to install a few tools that are defined in a YAML file just uh, beside my Docker file. Uh, I want to populate the library uh, data by uh, using the YAML file here and to install a few workflows here. Um, and that's it. And the last step, if you want to, is to customize the welcome page when you, when you show for the first time the, the first page of your Galaxy instance. So you can change the logo and the, the text that is displayed. So it's quite easy to, to do it. Once you have written all these Docker files and YAML file, you can of course build locally your, your Docker image by uh, using the Docker build command, but you can also share it and uh, put all these files into a GitHub repository and then have it built automatically by a Docker repository like the official uh, Docker hub or key.io, for example. And all this um, machinery is used automatically to, for the Galaxy Training Network, which is providing for every topic like assembly, genome annotation, or transcriptomic, or, or whatever, metabolomics, for example. Um, automatically, there is a, a, a Docker image which is built for each topic and that can be launched like this. So this is just a screenshot from the, the topic page on the Galaxy Training Network. And uh, it's very easy to launch uh, these um, containers in a, in a few seconds. I think that's it. And now I'm gonna leave the, for the next speaker. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Peter, you're up next. Um talking about setting up your own Galaxy server. Okay. Um, please ask questions in the Q&A. We will get to them at the end. Okay, we can see your slides, Peter. But I can't hear you. Okay, good. There we go. Now Very we're Okay, so Dave asked me to show the uh, um, on the example of our tool how why we use um, you know, public Galaxy server, why we actually you know move our tool to uh, the Galaxy. So before I will you know show our our story, I will just uh, introduce uh, our uh, group. I'm from Czech Republic and I am in a laboratory of. Um, 
uh, molecular cytogenetics, and uh, we investigate uh, mostly uh, plant genome. We are interested in a uh, repetitive DNA, and uh, we want to study uh, genome composition with respect some functional aspects like uh, centromere function and um, so on. And um, there are really not, uh, you know, if you look into uh, plant genomes, uh, you will see that there is a huge uh, difference between the uh, genome sizes of various plants. So there's actually like three orders of magnitude uh, differences in a genome size. Uh, the smallest genome is uh, Genlisa nigrocaulis. Largest genomes can be found in uh, genus uh, Fritillaria. And most of the you know, uh, size is uh, determined actually by the repetitive content. And uh, there are various types of repetitive uh, DNA. Uh, there are some like uh, focused DNA, like satellite DNA, which uh, occur in uh, some localized um, space you know, regions in the genome. And then you have a dispersed repeats, like a rental transposon, which could be actually really dispersed across whole uh, chromosomes. And uh, we are really interested in the, you know, the composition of these genomes with respect to uh, repetitive sequences and then what are the differences between the individual taxa and if we can you know, uh, understand better the evolution of the, of the genome. And uh, for this, we needed some methods how to study this repetitive DNA. And uh, you know, originally, you know, we could study the assembly genomes, but the problem is that this repetitive part is uh, quite often missing, or it's underrepresented in the in these uh, genomes, in these assemblies. So we could use also some wet lab approaches, which are usually you know biased, and you you don't get you know too much uh, too much information. And when uh, in 2005, uh, when the next generation sequencing was introduced, it turned out that this is really a great tool for us, at least for our group, to study repetitive DNA. Because when you do a sequencing, like even a like shotgun low pass sequencing with a low coverage, uh, then you are getting a lot of like unbiased information about the repetitive DNA because you are sampling basically chromosome randomly. And uh, because you are, we are studying something which is repetitive, so then you can get some idea how, how does it, you know, what is what repetitive is in the genome. However, there were no computational tools at that time. So we were forced uh, to develop uh, some R tools. And uh, I have to point that, you know, none of uh, the member of our group is really a, like, informatician or computer scientist by, by training. We are all biologists which, who are you know, like interested in bioinformatics. But uh, we gradually developed some, some pipeline. Uh, originally, uh, this pipeline was uh, utilizing some programs which are originally designed for uh, expression sequence stack uh, analysis. Later on, we developed uh, some graph-based uh, clustering algorithms and uh, we developed a pipeline which we call the repeat explorer. And this pipeline is uh, targeted to, to basically yield uh, as much as uh, possible information about the repetitive content in the uh, low pass shotgun uh, next generation sequencing uh, data. Uh, so the history of the pipeline is you know, shown here. Uh, well, when we developed uh, some you know, concept how, how to analyze this data, it was uh, in 2007. Then we improved our algorithm, but we were still using this uh, command line version of the program. And uh, we, it, this, this uh, tool was actually you know, quite, ha quite hard to use for an unexperienced user, especially biologists, because uh, most of the biologists were interested in that. So we wanted to provide this tool to uh, other biologists than our collaborate, collaborators. So uh, we decided that we will need to make this tool somehow a public because 
additionally, this tool require uh, quite some computational resources, and uh, normal, you know, normally you wouldn't able to run this tool just on the desktop. And at the time, uh, there was not really no good availability of these you know, computational resources. So we decided that we will set up our own um, our own uh, web server, which will run uh, Repeat Explorer as a service. So the question was, you know, what uh, type of platform we should use? And um, the Galaxy was actually, you know, one of the platforms we were considering and found at the end as a as the best one. And uh, because it solved for us a lot of uh, a lot of um, things, um, we needed some job management and scheduling for users because this uh, computational job took uh, some time to to run, and uh, so you need to somehow manage that your your server is not overloaded. Uh, you need also some uh, user management so users can you know, log in can upload their data and uh, then run a job. And also the users need to share data between each, each other. And uh, we also wanted to actually reuse uh, our old uh, PBS cluster. And we found that uh, Galaxy was actually developed uh, in a mind with that, you know, it could be easily, you know, it could be configured to be used on the PBS uh, server. And uh, there is also a good documentation about the, how to use a Galaxy platform and how to set up uh, your tool. Uh, so here on these pictures, you see, actually see our first uh, first cluster, which was offered as a as a public uh, service, and uh, it needed uh, you know, for us to write a tool definition. This is was something uh, Dan was talking about. Uh, we need to specify that what uh, are these jobs needs, what type of requirement they need. We needed to configure PBS cluster so it works well with the uh, with the Galaxy. Uh, set up the storage, uh, FTP server, and Postgres uh, database. And um, for that, you know, most of these tasks we manage ourselves. We need uh, some con you know, some discussion with uh, some IT specialists, but it wasn't really that uh, that difficult. So uh, this was the first server, uh, and uh, because we were able to publish you know, or announce it, this this server in uh, in um, 2013 in a journal of, you know, in bioinformatics, then people started to use it like more more often. Uh, and uh, but then we had a problem that you know, this server wasn't really designed to handle as uh, that many requests. But we were lucky that uh, our institute uh, later become a member of uh, Elixir Infrastructure. Elixir is infrastructure which helps uh, life scientists with storing, processing, and analysis uh, their data. And there are also you know. Uh, we have also a lot of collaborators in the in a Czech uh, Republic, Alexia, which help us with uh, moving this uh, this uh, service, uh, this uh, repeat express service to uh, to a new uh, to a new server, which is now so and now it is a part of uh, the Alexia provided uh, services. So we moved on. We get a better hardware. We don't have to, you know, deal with this hardware anymore because we have a, some. You know, it is administered by IT professionals, and uh, here you can see that you know it's uh, this uh, type of the analysis is quite specialized, and you know it's uh, oriented on plant and it's oriented on repeats, and not so many researchers is actually interested in this type of topic. But we can really see that the number of uh, running job was was growing. And I think uh, we think that Galaxy really help us to increase uh, the vis visibility of our tool and also uh, you know, make possible that people are, you know, especially biologists, were able to use these tools without any you know, difficult installation. Uh, and uh, we are also, you know, I, I think uh, Galaxy uh, server is also good that it provides uh, really uh, good uh, training platform. So we are, you know, 
organizing every year, uh, uh, every year um, workshop where we train usually you know about the 40, 40 participants who um, you know are interested in the repetitive uh, sequences. And for all this, you know, we are using uh, we are using some local instances of, uh, of Galaxy. And uh, also, what is great here that we will get on the workshop some some feedback uh, from uh, from users. Um, and I want to also mention additional benefits here that we are having Repeat Explorer on the Galaxy server. So the, the great thing about this is that you know when you once you have a data on your Galaxy. Uh, then you have also available a lot of tools which are available through a toolshed repository. So uh, we are providing some specialized tool, but we can always reuse some tools which are already programmed by other programmers and we are, which could be easily with basically one click installed into a Galaxy, uh, Galaxy server. And uh, also Garax, because you can create a complicated workflows uh, so uh, you can use uh, basically Galaxy server you know, for all the steps which are necessary for your analysis, you know, including data pre-processing and then you know, some analysis and visualization of these results. So if you are putting your tool, which is specialized in one thing to your Galaxy server, you are always getting all these other tools which are programmed by, uh, by the others. And what is also great that you, know, you can share workflows and, uh, and protocols and uh, Galaxy also, and this also you know, uh, basically increase the uh, reproduci reproducibility of your, of your results. And uh, also what I like about Galaxy that uh, you can easily file a bug report which goes together with your you know, data. So if user fails to do analysis with your tool. And uh, so he can you know, file a bug report. And uh, what we will get is uh, the access to the, his data or her data. Uh, what were the uh, conditions, um, how exactly these data were analyzed and what was the problem. And it helped us to uh, actually you know, uh, to improve our pipeline. So, and I think, you know, it's uh, where, what you are getting also with putting uh, your tool on a Galaxy server that there is a really lower barrier for uh, less experienced users because our users are mostly biologists. They are really not interested in bioinformatics. Um, and I think, you know, because we move this uh, uh, repeat expert on Galaxy server, uh, so far, we know that from you know, published uh, papers that uh, this server was used uh, for analysis of over 1,100 uh, plant species, for also for some comparative analysis, but also for a whole uh, genome assembly project because uh, you know, our server could be also used for uh, annotation of the complete genomes. And, uh, also, it, we had a, it had a little bit bigger impact because uh, even though we designed it in, uh, you know, in mind, uh, in focus on, on plant biology, uh, there was a lot of people who are actually using that for analysis of mammals, fish, insect, and, and, and worms. So uh, I want to conclude that if you have any you know, like tool, complicated tool you want to really make visible, uh, it's really good if you will, you know, make it available in your tool shed, and then you know you can uh, negotiate its publication either on a used Galaxy or you can uh, set up your uh, public, you know, uh, Galaxy server your own. And uh, this is our small team. Uh, Yuzi Matsas is a head of our team, and we are basically all of us. We are mostly you know, biologists who are just have uh, some interest in uh, bioinformatics. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Dan and Anthony. Uh, let's see. So I I want to throw out some stuff as to why you would actually want to do this. Um, so uh, let me share my screen. Which screen am I sharing? That one. Okay, let's do it. Share. 
Okay. So a couple of things. Um, the stuff Dan talked about, um, which was how to do this and the, you know, the, excuse me, the mechanics and the resources for defining your tool to Galaxy and getting it in the tool shed. Um, why you might want to do that? Well, you know some of the obvious reasons. It means you can. It means anybody can then put that tool on their Galaxy servers. Um, but it also seems to be that the act of putting it in the tool shed will also greatly increase the adoption of your tool. Okay, um, because it then makes it easy for anyone running their own Galaxy, including people just doing it on their desktop, to import the tool into their Galaxy server. And so it becomes much easier to use. And I recommend taking a look at this preprint, which Dan and I are co-authors on um, for that. For the stuff that um, Anthony and Peter talked about, we highlight any Galaxy instances we know about, any Galaxy platforms that we know about on the Galaxy platform directory, which you reach by clicking on use here. And public servers like Repeat Explorer go here. And if I search for repeat, yep, right there. And I click on that and it tells me information about it, what are the quotas, so on. Um, also for Docker images, we highlight those too. And so there's a bunch here that have been created. And as Anthony showed, these are fairly easy to set up. And that means anybody can then go and um, can set that up on their local instances, on their local infrastructure. So <clears throat> if you go through the effort to create a public server like Repeat Explorer or a Docker image, um, we will highlight it. We'll also highlight it in the monthly newsletters. Um, it makes it much easier to find because we actually want to get your work out there. So um, really, yeah, think about the impact of doing this. Um, it really is a great way to get your um, tool out there. So let's see. Um, no questions yet. Okay, that means I get to ask the questions, which is an utter mistake. Um, let's see, but here we go. Okay, Anthony, I have a question for you. Um, if you haven't set up a Docker image before, do you have an estimate on, on how long it would take? You know, if you're compute savvy and you have a tool and you've got it defined, you know, in the tool shed, how long would it take you to set up a Docker image that runs that tool that includes that tool? Any estimates? And you are muted. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> um, it's very, very easy to do. I think it, it's just a matter of if you really haven't, yeah, if you never have tried Docker before, maybe half a day or a day to learn how it works. But if you know it, it's just a matter of uh, minutes and minutes to write it, maybe a, a few more to build the image, but it's really uh, short. Okay. Thank you. Um, most of the Docker images that we list, we found about through publications. Um, yeah, and it, it's an easy way to make your tool accessible. So, yeah. okay. okay, no questions. Uh, Dan, you talked about several different classes of tools, um, starting with command line and then going through different levels of visualization. What's the step up? And I'm assuming it is a step up in effort to go from, say, a command line tool to a visualization tool to a data source tool. Um, how much more work is required for those other cases? Yeah, absolutely. So with the, uh, with the case of the data source tool, you need to have some buy-in from that external resource um, because it does involve this callback URL uh, 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 cycle. Basically, when you click on the tool inside of Galaxy, you get the user would get forwarded in their browser to that external uh, website along with a Galaxy URL link that that website at the end of the transaction where the user's configuring their data set, choosing what they want, applying filters and so forth. Uh, when they click send uh, data to Galaxy, it has to then, that external site then needs to post back to Galaxy. So that 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 is a bit more involved because it does involve some buy-in from that external resource. Um, 
But as far as writing the actual uh, tool it, inside of Galaxy, that part is about the same amount of effort. So it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward, I would say. Um, if it's going to be your first uh, Galaxy tool you're writing, you should probably start off with one of the standard tools, one of the standard tutorials, just so you can uh, wrap your head around the way that that works. Um, now, the, the other question was about um, the, the external display applications, perhaps. So those are sort of using a completely separate uh, framework than the standard Galaxy tools. So they, don't, they have a bit different uh, XML configuration. Um, but uh, still, if that, there's this external resource, a web server anywhere, that basically can accept a, um, a, a get parameter that points to a, a URL. You actually do not need to have any buy-in from that external resource because um, you can just leverage existing uh, uh, functionality of those external resources. That's assuming it's, it's able to natively consume URLs. Basically, you know, a lot of these external resources allow you just to create links. And you can think about the, the, the external display applications that basically just a fancy way to create a link based upon a user's data set um, that they can then click in their history, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and they can click on that and then they just forward in their browser along with uh, the URL to, a, to, along with a URL to that data set um, that does have some, some token authentication involved there um, within the URL. Um, now creating a Galaxy Interactive tool um, you know, the, the first hump you have to get over is you have to be able basically to create a Docker container or there needs to be a Docker container that exists for that resource already. Um, and, and so that, you know, that, that external um, bit uh, is, is, can be uh, difficult if you're not familiar with Docker. Um, but if there is a container released by a resource a lot of time uh, by, by, by some group, a lot of times you can just use that uh, Docker container directly. Um, and then writing the tool is uh, more or less just as easy um, as writing a standard Galaxy tool with the exception that you then just need to map some ports. Um, configuring the Galaxy instance is a bit more difficult. There is uh, a, a little bit of effort um, that you need to have as far as configuring or administering your Galaxy instance in order to have it be compatible with um, with the, the, the interactive tools and to make sure the proxy is all set up correctly and so forth. Um, and so that, that administration is a bit more work, um, but the designing and creation of the tool, I would say, is, is about the same once, once you have your Docker container. Okay. Thank you, Dan. That's great. Um, we now have three questions. So yeah, we're now swimming in them. So you, good. Thank you all for encouraging those questions. Um, first question, uh, from anonymous, is there anyone I can contact to review my tool? Does anybody want to take that? If no one else is jumping on, I would say absolutely. So uh, the best tools available are, you know, basically uh, released by the 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 IUC. So there's a group called the Intergalactic Utilities Commission, um, and they the, they develop the best practices for tools. Um, they also accept pull requests for tools. Um, and so if you have wrapped a tool, you can always go ahead and you can try to create a pull request against that repo. Um, you know, it, it, it's somewhat of a badge of honor, I would say, if, if you can convince uh, the tools IUC to accept your tool. I think it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great community that's really working to make the best tools available. Um, and they, they will definitely give you great feedback on to how to design your tools. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Christo, and uh, is there any difference in performance when using Docker instead of Conda in tool wrappers? That shows some advanced knowledge, Christo. Does anybody want to tackle that one? Does anybody know how to tackle that one? Nobody's taking it. I can make stuff up, Christo, but I can't answer it. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh... Well, I can say something oh. if... You wish. Uh, well, I, it's not about the Docker, but uh, we are actually using uh, just for testing uh, Singularity containers, and there is basically no no difference. I think nearly no difference in the performance. Okay. I don't know if you, Dan has the same experience, but uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, once you have your Docker con container, you know, sort of downloaded, pulled, installed, and your Bioconda package installed, 
the, the performance tends to be pretty similar. Um, now, again, depending upon where you have things executing, you know, um, clusters typically are more um, giving as far as installing Conda packages versus, you know, you might have some difficulty convincing a um, cluster admin to enable Docker, but you know you can go with singularity there and so forth. And so there's definitely uh, benefits and and to to, to both uh, or, or reasons to have different options. Um, now you know that the great thing about Docker and, and singularity, of course, is you know you get an even more reproducible sort of level versus Conda. You get a great great reproducibility with Conda. Um, except there's still some some sharing of packages and so forth. And so if you look at sort of the scale of like VMs, you have VMs and then you have con or you have VMs and you have Docker, then you sort of have Conda, right, uh, at the different levels. So, uh, you know, there, from Galaxy's perspective, there's no difference, but from the Conda versus Docker, they, they have their own differences. Thank you both. Um, from Umit, and I apologize for that pronunciation. Can I use cloud storage such as Amazon S3 in a Docker container? I think it's possible to have um, to connect S3 as an object store in Galaxy. I haven't ever tested it, but uh, it should be possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a strong recommendation. Um, yeah. So Umit, you can, but you might be out there on, on very um, new territory. So, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, if my tool is in the IUC, what is the next step to get tools into usegalaxy.org or usegalaxy.eu? Okay. Can, ooh, can I answer this one? Because I, I kind of know, and I, I know so little. So. Um, so to get it onto a large public server like that, um, it needs to be a widely useful tool and it needs to be well supported. And so if you have documentation, if you have a user help forum for your tool, um, that argues it should be there. I don't know if there's a formal process on use Galaxy EU. Um, there's, I don't think there is a formal process on usegalaxy.org. You can always post something in the help forum that says, hey, I'd really like to have this tool X on a usegalaxy.org server, um, sorry, .star server, um, you know, and then people can upvote it. But it, I think the main requirement is it needs to be widely useful and it needs to be well supported and well documented. Anybody else? I would uh, just point out if you look actually, so uh, at some of the, the repositories available, you can actually make a pull request to add your tool to, uh, for example, galaxy.eu. Um, and if it's in IUC, um, there's a good chance it will be accepted. Um, but so you can go ahead in addition to having these conversations, once that tool's in tools IUC, it's sort of, it has sort of a, a, a great, great, you know, it's considered a very good tool. Um, and so you can actually go ahead and make a pull request against uh, uh, some of these repositories that are available in order to actually have it um, um, set out. And I think if you look in the chat, someone uh, included a link to the actual repository, so. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Mauro. So Mauro is one of the admins for Use Galaxy U. So he's the admin, I think. Okay. Um, we are at eight o'clock, sorry, eight o'clock my time. So we're at the hour, I should say. You, you guys are like, well, it's not eight o'clock. It's only eight o'clock in my world. Um, so if the presenters need to go, I'm gonna say go. Um, I'm gonna keep recording and keep asking questions, but we are at the hour. And so I don't wanna keep anybody past that because that's our commitment. Um, and before we go, Peter, um, Let's see, you talked about the Repeat Explorer workshops. Did you talk about the one coming up? Because this is a chance to plug it. Well, uh, you know, uh, last year we canceled that because of the COVID. This year we decided that we are going, we are going to do that online. However, you know, the resources are limited. So uh, after four days of open registration, we got like uh, 100 uh, of people register over 100 actually so we had to actually close the registration and uh, 
our uh, workshop workshop is coming in i think it's uh, we will start in 25th of may and it will go through three weeks there will be some interactive session but uh, we will actually post some tutorials on the on the youtube so, so we'll have a channel so people can actually we can use it later as a as a manual yeah. thank you peter congratulations that's a good problem to have thanks so and anthony you have upcoming tutorials as well is that right or no uh, we have the gcc training sessions yeah yes that's right um thank you yeah so while we're here and before we lose even more people um, um at gcc the galaxy community conference which starts on june 28th and runs through july 10th it's all online we have a week of training and the week of training is what it starts with so the 28th of june through the second of july and part of that is um, wrapping tools, and part of that is Galaxy Admin. Now, Galaxy Admin is a separate registration. Um, wrapping tools, I think, is part of the, the main um, how to be a Galaxy developer part. But if you're interested, registration is really cheap, um, and early registration ends in three weeks, I think June 1st. Okay. So think about that. Okay. Um, what are we at here? Okay. So I'm going to declare victory, and then I'm going to ask a couple of remaining questions. Okay. Uh, okay, we answered that one. Answer uh, done. Um, okay. Um, so from Benoit, and again, I apologize. Um, how difficult is it to publish on the tool shed and to make dependencies available if it's not present in Conda? So, if what you need is not already in Conda for your tool, how hard is it? get your tool into the tool shed. Yeah, so my first recommendation would be to actually add your tool to Bioconda. Um, what's really nice is if you add your tool to Bioconda, um, the BioContainers uh, project will actually go ahead and make a Docker container for that tool. So then you'll actually have um, it available as Conda and you'll have it available as um, a, a Docker image that you could run in Docker or in Singularity. Um, and that's just for the underlying dependency. So I would, I would recommend, you know, taking that step and actually adding it to Bioconda or to Conda Forge, for example, depending upon which, which tool you're looking at. Um, and, and, and so if it's not available, you can always just, you know, roll your own uh, Docker image and specify your namespace um, and then the, 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 the name of that image, for example, if you want to. Um, but I would definitely recommend trying first to get it available into uh, Bioconda, for example. Thanks, Don. Thanks for the question, Benoit. And a, a final question, I'm gonna declare this the last one, uh, from someone I think I've actually met, but whose name I hesitate to try and pronounce, Aaron Nizja, Nizja, I don't know. And I, again, I apologize. Um, can interactive environments be easily integrated as an interactive tool in our personal Galaxy instance? I see it is disabled in use Galaxy servers for some time. Thank you. I, I'll take that as well. Yes, yeah, so um, before we had Galaxy interactive tools, we had this really cool thing called Galaxy interactive environments. And so you can launch, for example, RStudio and Jupyter Notebooks and so forth um, on, on a Galaxy data set. Um, but you can actually take those existing underlying Docker containers that were built for that process and then go ahead and you can just write a Galaxy tool that references that same container. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I think it's quite easy. There is a, a, you know, there is a little bit of effort you have to put in to create that new um, Galaxy tool wrapper, um, but it is a relatively straightforward process. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to declare victory. Thank you all. Um, thank you all for participating in the call. Um, thank you, Peter, Anthony, and Dan for presenting. Um, it's a huge favor. I owe you all drinks with little paper umbrellas in them. Um, and what else? Let's see. So the recording for this and the slides for this will be posted online uh, this week. Um, our next webinar in this series is in two weeks, which is resources for Galaxy administrators and infrastructure providers. And that will be presented by Lucille 
and Mauro, and I know Mauro's on this call because he asked a question. Or um, So that'll be in two weeks' time, same time, same registration process. And um, thank you all for being here, and I hope to see you again online. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.